Okay. Can you see the screen? Yep. Wow, the technology is actually working. How often does that happen? <laughs> Fingers crossed. There you go. Um, uh, yeah, I'm seeing it as the whole computer. Are you going to? Yeah, I'm going to go like this. Change to the, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so I've got um, three minutes left, you know, before 12, so I figure maybe we start at like 12.01 or something. Does that sound good? Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm assuming since people might be eating, it would be a good idea not to use the video. Like, that could scare people. <laughs> However you want to do it. Um, I'm, I'll uh, just talk for a minute about just Napcrag and CASFUM and just a little background on that and then I'll introduce you and I, frankly I was just going to read the the blurb that it's you know that's already on there if that's okay that's fine or if you want I can introduce myself um, but that sounds great or if you want to just use a couple uh, of sentences and not the whole thing that's fine uh, can you okay. hear me okay oh, yeah yeah okay great uh, likewise yes Okay, yes. So I'll tell you what, I'll I'll do a short version of the thing and then let you fill in uh, whatever else you want. How's that? Super. All right. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I know I know it's a lot of work and it's a super big help and I just um, want to make sure you know I appreciate you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. I love talking about this stuff and I appreciate your invitation and the opportunity to share my passion with the group. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, it's just so frustrating for me to, to live in a country where, you know, really all this work doesn't really change anything, right? Because <laughs> we're, we're, we're emotionally incapable of having these difficult decisions unlike the rest of the developed world. So, yeah, that that's my chronic frustration and passion to hopefully change that someday. How did you get interested in it? Oh, um, um, really? The I mean, the short answer. We can talk more later. But the short answer is, I was an engineer for went to med school, and I did economic evaluations of chemical plants. So, ah. so, so I came into all this with some training in economics and projecting out costs and return on investment, return on equity, and you know all that kind of stuff. So then the you know, the world of cost effectiveness and cost analysis used a lot of terms I was already familiar with. So, mm -hmm. so there wasn't as much of a learning curve for me as maybe some others. Mm -hmm. All right. So my, my clock says 12 on the dot, so I'll, I'll wait one more minute and then I'll get us going. Thank you. No worries, we'll work together on that. Yeah, don't worry, I have a map back now. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the um, cost analysis work group um, seminar or webinar yeah, on the biggest well. mistakes in economic evaluation. My name is Dr. Richard Young. I'm the U.S. co-chair of the cost analysis work group under the Committee for the Advancement of Science and Family Medicine, which is under the North American Primary Care Research Group. My co-chair. Uh, Canada is Andrew Pinto, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, and I'm sure he's very sorry about that. Um, I'd like to give just a quick background. Um, 
This is our third webinar in a series, and our hope is that it could be enduring material for anyone in the future wanting to learn more about cost analysis. Um, it's available on the NAPCRAG website. So if you go on the NAPCRAG website and just in the search block uh, write out cost analyses and click that, it'll take you to the web page where the other two webinars are there, and of course this will be added soon. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Jeffrey Hotch. He was originally uh, working for the uh, Center for Excellence in Economic Analysis Research at the University of Toronto. He is currently the Professor Chief of the Division of Health Policy and Management at UC Davis in California. So we are so honored to have uh, Dr. Hotch, and why don't you take it away? Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the group for inviting me to speak today, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. used to keep you from doing what you want to do, or you might be able to use it to help advocate for what you believe in. And it would be important, you'll be more successful at what you want to do if you're able to avoid some of these mistakes that fall into either creating it or using the information. So I'd like to start with the first type of 
mistake, what I'm calling uh, the doing of the analysis, and in particular, focus on the data. So these data mistakes I like to group into the rule of two and the rule of right. This is how I keep myself from making mistakes. I think of the rule of two and the rule of right. What do I mean by the rule of two? The rule of two, two involves when you're doing cost-effectiveness analysis or economic evaluation, it's super important that you're analyzing two things. You must be looking at both cost and outcome or effect. And a lot of times people will focus on just one or the other. They'll focus only on costs or they'll focus only on outcome or effect. And if you're looking at both of them, you're on the right road. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about why this might happen and why that might be a mistake. This is a beautiful figure talking about the different types of costs. You can see at the top there's a box called total costs and you can see the total cost can be divided into two different types of costs. And those types of costs can be divided into more types of costs. So it's really easy to get caught up in all this information and to think, yes, this is important information. And it is important information. However, it's only one half of economic evaluation because this is only the cost portion of economic evaluation. And a lot of people, when they start to do a cost study or an economic evaluation, they say, gee, I need someone to tell me what sort of costs are important, what costs are out there, and which ones do I need. And you can see that there are different sorts of costs accruing in different silos. There are healthcare costs, there are legal costs, there might even be tax implications. So don't get me wrong, cost is super important. It's just not the only thing that matters. However, your choice of which type of cost to focus on can matter. Here's an example where uh, Dewa and colleagues, she's a mental health economist, she is studying early intervention programs. So uh, these are young people who are perhaps having a first episode of psychosis, and the table I'm showing you, table four, has in its first column a look at the different perspectives you might use. So the first perspective is a Ministry of Health perspective. This is the healthcare payer and it doesn't focus on any other costs. The very last row shows a full-body perspective where we're looking at as many different costs as you can. Costs that accrue to the government, but costs that accrue as well to the other groups that are non-government, costs that accrue to the healthcare sector, and costs that accrue to sectors that are not the healthcare sector. So you can see on the rows the different perspectives for costs. On the columns, you can see two different groups. One group is people who have been involved in the program for less than a year. That's the less than or equal to 12 months. The middle column says greater than 12 months. These are people who have been involved in the program for more than a year. And the last column is a difference column. And it shows you, you can see the difference column says minus $2,498. It shows you that if you're only looking at the Ministry of Health costs comparing the people who have been in the program for a long time versus the people who have been in the program for a short time, it looks like the people who have been there for more than one year cost the healthcare payer, the public payer, more money because it costs about $2,500 more. However, if you take a different perspective, now I'm going to go to the last row and you can see 1,272. Now the story is different. There's no trickery going on. The reason it looks like it's now $1,200 cheaper when you're talking about established clients versus new clients is because the perspective is broader. So this graph, this, this table here, is meant to show you that who you're looking at, like which patient group, the, the new people or the established clients, and which perspective you're looking at can influence the cost number. Uh, of course, you're going to need more than just the cost number, but even if you were only focused on the cost number, it's important that you get the perspective correct for the cost. And you might be wondering what's the pers right perspective to use. It's been my experience that when health economists teach classes in academic settings, they will tell you that the right perspective is a societal perspective. If you want to make society a better place, 
you need to take a societal perspective. But it's also been my experience that decision makers care very much about their perspective. So if you're trying to influence the hospital, the hospital is going to be concerned with the hospital's costs. If you're trying to influence the Ministry of Health or Medi-Cal or Medicaid, they're going to be concerned with what costs they pay. If you're trying to influence the police, they want to know about their costs. So the right perspective from my perspective is the one of your decision maker. So while you're doing the rule of two and getting cost and outcome, make sure you're doing the rule of right and getting the right perspective. And the right perspective is the perspective of the group that you want to influence. They will care about the costs that accrue to them. Now you might think, all right, I've got the costs. Am I done? Sadly, the answer is no. You need both costs and outcomes. Here's a study looking at the cost of schizophrenia in three countries, the United States, Canada, and the UK. And in this study, they are going to produce three estimates for how much it costs to treat schizophrenia. Now, it's happening. This, this study is getting estimates from the different countries. So they'll have to do things to make sure that there's not a difference that comes because there's a different currency or there's a different year in which it was estimated. But after you make all the apples and the oranges equal, after you make everything as equal as possible, you still see a difference in how much it costs to treat people by country. And you say to yourself, well, yeah, but is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. You need outcome to know whether or not low costs represent not treating people and that's why the costs are low because you're not paying for them and they're having bad outcomes or you need to be able to see whether those low costs are related to efficiency and the high costs are just wasting money. But the point here is that while there is a market for publications on the cost of conditions, diseases, and treatments, to do economic evaluation, which is just smart shopping, you need to know both cost and outcome because otherwise you're just left thinking, hmm, the costs differ, but I don't know who's better and who's worse. Now, which outcome should you use? Remember, if you're going to do costs, you should use the right perspective. And if you're going to do outcome, you should pick the right outcome. But which outcome to use? Unfortunately, it sometimes makes a big difference which outcome you use. This is a paper by Dr. Cron et al. It's from 1994 at JAMA. And he was looking at screening prostate uh, cancer he's screening for. There's different ways to screen for it. His question is, should you screen for it or not? And he made a model to um, take a hypothetical cohort of men ages 50 to 70. And he said, you know what? I wonder if we do this screening, whether it's going to help them or not. And if he uses the outcome of life expectancy, then by screening, he can help them have longer life expectancy. But if in his model, he chooses an outcome called quality adjusted life expectancy. So now we're not looking only at did they live longer. We're also factoring in their quality of life. Well, in his analysis, this leads to diminished quality adjusted life expectancy. So if you look at how long people live, they live longer with screening. And if you look at the quality adjustment of how long they live, they actually get fewer quality adjusted life years with the screening. So you can see that outcome makes a difference. Which one you choose influences whether or not this is actually going to help your patients or not. So <clears throat> what outcome should you use? You should use the outcome that resonates with your readers. So if you're in a particular area and there's a type of outcome they like to use in that area, I think it would make sense to use that outcome. Here's an example from um, a study in Baltimore. Uh, Lisa Dixon and her team were looking at two different types of vocational rehab for people who have severe mental illness. So it is possible for people with severe mental illness to work. And the question is, should you train them until they feel ready to go to work? Or should you try to get them jobs? And once they get the jobs, should you then train them? So you want to place and then train, or do you want to train and then place? So IPS, Individual Placement and Support, was one uh, new intervention she was looking at, and this was going to help people get the competitive jobs and then was going to support them in that. 
and that was going to be compared to an enhanced vocational rehab program. And this program was going to have people in sheltered workshops, so they wouldn't be making large money, but they would be getting a little bit of money, and they would be sheltered, and if they wanted to, maybe they could find a way into the competitive workforce, but um, the question was, which one is going to be more effective for this group of clients? Well, you can see in the column called IPS, you can see in the sub-column called mean, that IPS had 326 hours of competitive work. That's not so bad. Compare that to EDR or Enhanced Vocational Rehab, only 28. And you can see 15 weeks of competitive work on average compared to just one week for EDR. So IPS is killing EDR on the outcome of competitive work. And remember, the people put this together with the notion that they wanted to help people with severe mental illness find jobs in a competitive workplace. However, when we submitted the paper, it came back with reviewer comments saying, you know what, other things matter to patients in this group. In fact, the reviewers thought, you know what really matters is total earnings. Money you earned in the sheltered workshop plus money you might have earned in a competitive job. Now the story changed. If you look at combined earnings from competitive and sheltered job, you can see IPS at 1,997. <sighs> Unfortunately, that is less than EDR at $2,005. Yikes. So a different outcome gives us a different conclusion. Which is the right one to use? My perspective is you need to use the one that seems relevant to your audience, and in this case, the relevant outcome, well, there were two relevant outcomes, a competitive work outcome and a total earnings outcome, and they provided a richer story. So in terms of the rule of right for effect, use the right outcome. Use the one that resonates in your field, and perhaps use the one that's going to help the decision maker with his or her decision. So this is examples of the rule of two, look at cost and effect. Examples of the rule of right, use the right perspective for costs, use the right outcome for effect. The last point I want to make is about using the right alternative. So here's a study looking at Assertive Community Treatment Act for people who are homeless and mentally ill in Baltimore, Maryland in the late 90, uh, 1990s. So, you might read the study and go, wow, this looks super good. This study is showing that ACT, Assertive Community Treatment, is cost-effective compared to usual care conditions in Baltimore, Maryland. So, even if this was the best study ever done with the funniest title for the article, it still might not be relevant for your setting if your setting doesn't have usual care that matches what was going on in Baltimore, Maryland in the late 1990s. So it's important to make sure that the comparator in the study matches the one that seems relevant for your group or your decision. And if there's a change in year or location or situation that influences or can makes a difference between your setting and the setting in the article you're looking at, then you know there might be a mistake if you were to follow the findings blindly because the comparator is wrong. Even if the comparator were right for that study, it may not be the right one for you in your situation. So in terms of the rule of right, make sure they're using a right alternative. I'm going to summarize the four data mistakes right now um, so that you'll know that we've covered part one of three. And in summary, what I was talking about in terms of mistakes people make with their cost-effectiveness data Sometimes they don't seem to remember you need both cost and outcome. Sometimes people collect costs but don't report it from the correct perspective. And by correct perspective, I mean the one that will resonate with the decision maker. Sometimes people pick a wrong outcome, one that makes no clinical sense or has no clinical meaning, or one that's very difficult for the decision maker to use. Last but not least, in terms of data mistakes, Sometimes people pick a fake or a wrong alternative. If it's a team that's making this analysis, it's possible that the team will involve a health economist as well as a clinical partner. And the clinical partner is essential to make sure that the alternative 
usual care that's being selected for comparison with this new treatment is relevant, is real, is something that people would believe is a realistic usual care option. So those are the four mistakes related to data. I'd now like to talk about mistakes related to analysis. So I'm going to cover four more mistakes related to analysis and then two more related to results and then I'll open this up for questions then. Okay, so we're talking about types of mistakes. We're still in the doing part and we're now focused on analysis. So the, the three comments I'm going to make about analysis have something to do with time horizon, making sure you're doing subtraction, and dealing with uncertainty. Here is a study looking at trying to improve chronic disease prevention in a primary care setting. So this primary care intervention has two parts. There is a practice level intervention with a practice facilitator who will help the practice um, with their prevention efforts. There's also a patient level intervention going as well. A prevention practitioner is going to be involved. So here's an RCT looking at the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of trying to help people do chronic disease prevention. And you can see that their outcome that they chose was a composite measure. And you can see that they're reporting the extra cost. So I believe that it's really helpful for people to see the results so they can see exactly what you're getting and what's happening. You can see in the middle of this graph, I'm on page 20 now, you can see that the control group is able to meet two eligible action, actions. So just doing usual care, there are, two, um, inter, there are two actions that are actually met using control. So it's not like zero happens, there's two that happens. If you do the prevention practitioner, you can see that that provides five. So you go from two to five, and the gain there is about three additional actions are met, which is great. However, if you're only talking about three, then you are not talking about how much extra it costs. You need to find a way, if you're going to do economic evaluation, to bring in the extra cost as well as the extra effect. So here you can see on the vertical, cost is measured, and you can see the dot for control and the dot for what we're calling the prevention practitioner or PP you can see the line that goes from the, the control group to the, the practice prevention, the prevention practitioner dot. This line has a slope. That slope is equal to the ratio of the extra cost over the extra effect. Now, the reason that's important is because that's telling you the rate at which you're acquiring one more unit of outcome. And you can see that that slope is $26.43. Now remember earlier I told you there was also a practice facilitator, so that's happening at the practice level. So if you do both the prevention practitioner, the PP, as well as the practice facilitator, the PF, at the same time, you can see that you will get a bit more gain and you will get a bit more cost as well. So you can see the bit more gain as that smaller horizontal arrow, uh, arrow going from five to a little bit more than five and you can see the extra cost as well. So the extra cost is going to get spread over a smaller amount of extra effect. Or another way of saying it is the line connecting the two dots is going to be steeper, which means that you're going to have greater extra cost for a little bit less extra effect. Now each unit of extra effect is going to cost you an additional $93. So the slope of this line here is 93, and the slope of that line there is 26. And cost effectiveness analysis gives you the dots and helps you connect the dots with the line and tells you the slope of the line. The slope we like to call the incremental cost effectiveness ratio because it's going to give us a ratio of the extra cost to the extra effect. And this is very important to health economists because even if you did nothing, if you just did control, you're still going to help people meet two actions that are going to help them um, when they are trying to reduce their chances of chronic disease. Now you might say, 
yeah, this outcome called actions met. I'm not sure. I think that's the perfect way to do this. I think the outcome should be how many chronic diseases did you prevent? Well, remember, this is an RCT. This is not something that's going to go for 40 years. So there becomes an opportunity, if you want, to not only analyze what happened in your trial, but if you want to, you can go then beyond your trial and try to model and try to predict what would happen 30, 40, 50 years out. So this picture here shows you the importance of looking at the extra effect and the extra cost and shows you that it can change depending on how much you're doing already. It also reminds you that if you're not happy with the outcome that you have, uh, that measure of effect that you have in your trial, you can also model it out into the future if you wish. So the previous example was to help you understand the difference of time horizon. That's how long we're going to make the analysis go. In the RCT, it might go for a year. But if you wanted to model 40 years into the future and see how it looked in terms of reducing chronic disease, you could choose a much longer time horizon. There's this trade-off, you know, it's a, it's a preference about whether you want to model way out into the future and try to get to what you think are outcomes that matter, but you have to make a lot of assumptions to get there. So the question is, is it worth it to you? The other point I wanted to make with that example was the importance of calculating differences. And you can see the differences as the extra that you're getting in terms of extra outcome or extra cost. Now it is possible after you make all of these estimates, it's possible that there's a great deal of uncertainty in terms of, well, gee, I'm not sure what number this should be or that number should be. Or it's also possible that you didn't take all of the population when you did your study. Maybe, maybe you took a sample and uh, if someone else took a different sample, maybe even if you took a different sample and you did the same study the next year, it's possible your results might differ. So these two types of uncertainty, the type where you don't know what number to use and the type where you've got sampling uncertainty, these are really important in economic evaluation. And one of the most important mistakes I see is when people report an estimate, but they don't characterize the uncertainty. So I want to talk just a little bit more about the two types. When I'm talking about you don't know a number you want to know, maybe you are able to prevent one hospitalization, but you don't know how much money that saves. You know you presented, prevented one, but is that saving $500 or $1,000? $2,000. When you don't know what number to use, oftentimes health economists use what's called a sensitivity analysis. So they say we're going to vary the number that you don't know and we'll see if that varies the results by a lot or little and we'll also see if that varies the conclusions. I'm going to talk about the second type of uncertainty after I give you an example of what I'm talking about. In this study here, Dewa and colleagues are looking at a stigma program to address mental illness in a workplace. And the challenge that they have is they don't have super great data on whether this stigma program is actually going to lead to fewer episodes of short-term disability or maybe it won't lead to sh fewer episodes, maybe it will reduce the length of an episode. So they go about modeling by taking all this information that's in the literature and putting it together in a model. And they say, you know what, there's two things that we're really not sure about. And they put those two variables that they're not sure about on a graph. You can see on the horizontal axis, they have a variable called shorter length of short-term disability episode. And what that means is if this stigma program can reduce the length that someone is away from work because they are suffering a mental illness, it's possible that this program will actually pay for itself because if you can get people back to work sooner, then you have fewer losses that accrue because of their disability. On the vertical axis, you can see fewer short-term disability episodes. So maybe the program is able to reduce the number of people or the number of episodes that happen um, because maybe if there's less stigma then there are people who get what they need sooner and then they don't go on short-term disability as often. 
So how do you read something like this? Let's pretend that this new stigma program can reduce by two episodes the, um, the number of uh, short-term disability leaves. And let's say as well, it's also able to reduce every single episode by one day. At that point, where I'm going one over to the right and two up, at that point the program pays for itself. So it's possible that we don't know whether it can do that or not. But it is also possible that you have a gut sense about whether or not it's likely that this new treatment or this new intervention is going to be in the neighborhood of two or three or four, or whether it's more in the neighborhood of zero or one half. So this picture tells you you can look wherever you want, wherever you believe the true values are, and you can get a sense of what the results are telling you. And it's also possible for you to see how sensitive your results are to the variables that you don't know. This type of graph, which is now a two-way sensitivity analysis because you have two variables, one on the horizontal, one on the vertical, and you both don't know, if you use this sort of information, it helps us cope with the fact that we don't know about those variables. So economic evaluation is about organizing what you do know. It's not going to tell you the answer, but it will tell you this is the state of the knowledge. It will summarize what you know. So this type of uncertainty picture is really, really important when people report the results. And this is why it's one of the first things that I look for when I'm looking at whether an economic evaluation has been done correctly. I look to see if there is a sensitivity analysis. Did they vary one variable? Did they vary two? Did they vary multiple variables? If they vary two, you might see a picture like you see in figure two. So this is the type of sense, uh, uncertainty analysis that deals with sensitivity, how sensitive are your results. There's another type of uncertainty, and that's related to statistical or stochastic or sampling uncertainty. So this is the idea that if you do your study today, you might get slightly different results from if you do your study in two or three weeks, even if you had more or less the same patient population in your practice. It's just because when you take a sample from a population, there's going to be some noise. And you want to create a way of characterizing how much noise there was. Oftentimes when we're looking at regression, we think about confidence intervals. And you can think of it that way in economic evaluation as well. For example, going back to that paper, looking at homeless people who are mentally ill in Baltimore, Maryland. You can see on the left a, a plane, a graph. It divides space into four quadrants. The vertical is telling you about the extra costs. The horizontal is telling you about the extra effect. Because these people were homeless, the outcome that they chose to look at was additional days in stable housing. Kind of makes sense if you're studying a homeless population. So you can see that the groups have been divided into African Americans and Caucasians. We were forced to do this because randomization failed. So we had to do subgroup analysis, not because it was initially thought of, but because the data basically compelled us to do this because of uh, lack of randomization working. You can see the estimate, both for the whites and for the blacks, both of those estimates occurring in the little tiny circles, both of those are in the saves money and more effective quadrant. So you're going to be providing additional days of housing and you're going to be saving money. And that is super good news. However, it's somewhat misleading if you just stop with that estimate. What you need to do, in my opinion, is to characterize the uncertainty. And I'm about to tell you why, because I think it might make a different set of conclusions come to your head. Think about it. If I just said to you, hey, would you like to save money and help people? Everyone would think that was a no-brainer. But watch what happens when we start to introduce some uncertainty. The first thing I want you to notice is that the confidence ellipse, that egg for the Caucasians, the white subjects, is very, very large. That means statistically, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the true extra cost and extra cost is for white subjects. This, in this case, is due to the fact that 
there aren't that many people who are white in this study. The second thing you should notice is the confidence interval that ellipse for blacks is much smaller. That means statistically we are much less uncertain because it's a smaller, it's a smaller neighborhood, that ellipse. And in that ellipse, we believe that the truth is hiding somewhere in there. Because with the formula we're using, 95% of the time when we make the ellipse, we capture the truth. So you can see that it's a smaller ellipse for the black subjects compared for, to the white subjects. So you can say, statistically, we are less uncertain because there's a smaller confidence interval. However, if you think about not only size but location, if you think how a decision maker might think, if you think about if you were actually going to use these results, location becomes extremely important. Take a look again at that large confidence interval for the white subjects. Can you see how most of it is in the southeast quadrant? Basically what I'm saying is, yeah, we're super uncertain, but we're super uncertain about exactly how much money you're going to save and how much you're going to help people. If you take a look at the confidence interval for the African American subjects, although it's smaller, you might also be able to see that it captures area from all four quadrants. This is a fancy way of saying we have literally no idea if we're going to save money or cost you more. We have no idea if we're going to help people or hurt people. Because it's capturing area, real estate, in all four quadrants, it's basically saying, I don't know where it is. So yeah, the estimate looks really good. We're saving money and we're helping people. But when you characterize the uncertainty, you can see that we are really uncertain for the African Americans and for the white subjects is a different story. So I checked with the psychiatrists I was working with and I said, is there some reason clinically why helping homeless people from one racial group should be different from helping people from another racial group? And they explained to me that no, it's nothing in assertive community treatment that would be related to race. But if you understood better the access patterns, what access to care these two groups had, you could understand why you were seeing the results you were seeing. Because ACT succeeds frequently because it's able to reduce hospitalizations. And in this case, at the beginning, most of the white subjects were able to get lots and lots and lots of access to hospitalization. And with ACT, ACT was able to reduce that hospitalization. For African Americans, they had lack of access. So if you're already being blocked from a resource, a program that might reduce it won't look super great because you already don't have a lot of access to that resource to begin with. So we were able to uncover access issues by looking at the uncertainty. But the point that you need to remember is that when someone shows you an estimate, you also want them to show you a characterization of the uncertainty. What are some of the other plausible values that the estimate could be? So to summarize that, we were talking about mistakes that one might make if we were doing analysis. Sometimes people don't use the right time horizon. They might uh, look at a prevention program, but only look at it for the first six weeks and not look what happens way out in the future. Uh, sometimes people forget to subtract, they forget to do the difference, they forget to look at the extra cost or the extra effect. Sometimes people only report an estimate and they don't give you any uncertainty measures and sometimes people only give you one type of uncertainty. They only give you a, a sensitivity analysis. They don't create a confidence interval. So those are four different types of mistakes that people make that I would consider to be analysis mistakes. I'd like to quickly go through two others and then open up the floor for questions. So now we're in the type of mistakes that I call using. And they're basically mistakes that happen when people interact with the results. Um, and one of the first things people think about when they look at the results is, well, this must be right because there are numbers. And I want to caution you that it's important for you to look at the numbers and to say, does this make sense? We were doing a study looking at a group in Canada that makes recommendations about whether cancer drugs are cost-effective or not. And we reviewed the critique 
that this group did of various cost effectiveness analyses that were coming in. And one of the things we noticed was oftentimes this group said, you know what, it doesn't make sense the estimate that we're getting for how long people are living. For example, let's say we're looking at metastatic lung cancer and there are people who make a model that show that the drug is cost effective. When you actually look at the model, I'm encouraging you to say, in your head, how long might you expect someone with metastatic lung cancer to live? And if someone has made a cost effectiveness model that goes for 50 years and it shows that people with metastatic lung cancer live for 35 years, if that doesn't fit with your experience, it might be that there's something wrong with the model, even though it's produced a number. And in this case, in this paper I'm referring to, they found a lot of times that there was an overestimation of survival. So the problem was not that the model was going for 40 years. The problem was that the people in the model were living for 40 years when the physicians thought clinically, this does not make sense. So even if the analysis seems super complicated and you don't quite get what's going on, it's important for you to look at the output and say, does this kind of outcome make sense for this kind of patient group? And in this case, when we were looking at cancer, it didn't make sense. And as a result, we had to find a way to make the lifespans more believable, more in line with what clinical experience would suggest. So the second thing to keep in mind when using the results is the idea that cost effectiveness is just one part of a decision. A decision maker will be thinking about a lot of other things. And sometimes it's possible to even change the number that you have estimated as the cost effectiveness estimate. Cost effectiveness can be improved, budget impact can be improved, and there are also sometimes other things that matter. So I just want to distinguish cost effectiveness for budget impact. Cost effectiveness is like the rate at which you get extra outcome. Like you can get a good rate or a bad rate. If you get a good rate, it's called economically efficient. But if you're spending a whole lot of money and getting very little, that's an inefficient way to spend your money. But that's really different from how much money are you spending. Budget impact is about how much do you spend. And that is something that matters a lot to decision makers. If it's really efficient way to spend money, but they don't have the quantity of money that they need, they're still not going to do it, even if it is cost effective and vice versa. Sometimes there are things that are really, really, really not cost effective, but because the budget impact is small, it's possible for decision makers to say, yeah, we're going to do this. Uh, as an example of how cost effectiveness can change, sometimes you might see, let's say we're looking at a drug, the drug company might reduce the price. A reduction in price will actually reduce the extra cost. So you might have put out an estimate of the cost effectiveness, but if the drug uh, sorry, if the decision maker is able to get a reduction in price, it's possible that your estimate might be more attractive now because the extra cost has been reduced. A targeted use is another way to make something more cost effective. If you restrict this new intervention or program or treatment just to the people for whom it's going to be the most effective, then targeted use might be a way to increase the extra effectiveness. So if you change the extra cost or you change the extra effect, it's possible the cost effectiveness has just changed as well. Another way that you can help people do things <laughs> that they might not think are cost effective or they might think are infeasible is by reducing the budget impact. So if you, again, if you reduce price, it will reduce the budget impact by reducing the overall cost. Also, if you target use, it will reduce the quantity of people who are getting this. So it is possible that by doing either one of these strategies to reduce budget impact, something that is not cost effective may actually be something a decision maker decides to go with. So let's say you can't reduce price and you can't target anymore. Are there other factors that come into play? Yeah, there really are. There's notions of fairness and equity. There's also notions of social pressure and voter appeal and Twitter and social media. And these are real factors that help inform how decision makers or other people who might be in charge of resources decide to spend those scarce resources. So in summary, there are many other things that matter besides economic evaluation. I believe 
economic evaluation will be one thing that comes into play, one thing that matters, and you will be more effective at what you want to do if you can understand what economic evaluation is, smart shopping, and what are some of the mistakes that people make when they present it to you. So just one last piece of information. I really do believe that some of the trade-offs that you can see through economic evaluation, the extra cost and the extra effect, some of these trade-offs and whether they're worth it or not are very influenced by the context. So if you're in cancer, people might have one feeling about the trade-off versus the same trade-off for extra cost and extra effect in, I don't know, say something like mental illness. So some areas and some diseases seem to be um, have different trade-offs, let us say, than other areas. And it's important for us to be able to understand this when we get into the policy arena. And now I have two more slides to summarize and then I'll open things up for questions. As a review of some of the mistakes, the mistakes involve something to do with data, something to do with analysis, and something to do with using the results. And most of these mistakes are things that you can catch by just saying to yourself, does this make sense? So even if you don't know technically exactly what's going on, if you can say to yourself, do we have both cost and effect? Is it from the right perspective? Are we looking at a real, um, a real treatment alternative? And, and do we use the outcome that kind of matters? Then you'll be way ahead of the game. These are important questions. Do you happen to remember, hey, are there any time horizon issues, like maybe important things happening in the future? Or do these people remember to subtract, to look at extra? You'll be even further ahead. The last thing to remember, of course, is the uncertainty. They need to show you in their analysis how certain or uncertain they are of their results, and they can do this in a variety of different ways. Last but not least, don't forget to ask yourself, do these results make sense? Because if they don't make sense, then it doesn't matter how complicated the model is. And remember, though, that once the results do make sense, it's possible people will have other factors that will go into their decision making. So in conclusion, an economic evaluation has to answer some of the blanks in the following statement. It has to put in values for these letters. In A years, it will cost B dollars to get one more unit of C when using D instead of E in patients of type F in context G. So the analyst, the person who writes this study or does this analysis, is going to make choices about those letters. And if the choices you would make are different from the choices they would make, then their analysis is going to be problematic for you. It's not going to be helpful. So I hope you have enjoyed this talk. I'm going to open things up for questions. And while we're getting the questions set up, I'd like to remind you that if you do a Google search on cost and NAP credit, you can see this excellent page that uh, Richard and Andrew have put together that have previous talks on cost-effectiveness analysis and economic evaluation. I think it's a great resource. So I'd like to open up things for questions now if we could. Great. That was super, Dr. Hodge. Thank you for doing that. I guess um, there was a, a little technical glitch early on in your talk, at least for some of the listeners for maybe in the first couple minutes of your talk, it wasn't coming through as well. Was there any you know, big picture points you made that you recall in that very early part that maybe, you know, didn't get covered as you got into the details. So um, if anyone wants to email me or contact me, I can answer specific things you might have missed. I think early on I would have tried to make the case that even if you absolutely hate economic evaluation, I believe it's going to play a bigger role in your life as people start to really scrutinize what is being spent in healthcare and whether it's good value or not. And I think primary care can make a huge contribution to giving us more value for the money we spent, but that's only going to happen um, by engagement in the methods that we use to show value. That's the point I'd want to make sure people got from early on. Great, thank you. So yeah, the, the chat feature on the webinar is up, and so if anybody has any questions, please type them in. And so far, none. I will go ahead and say that 
Um, there is a pre-conference workshop um, at this year's NetCrag meeting in Montreal uh, where the cost analysis group is one of the offerings. Uh, we suggest that anybody who would like to attend would get uh, more out of the session. If you're uh, able to uh, look at the three webinars online before you attend, uh, if not, that's okay. You're still, we'd still love to have you. All right, there's an audience question about the, the first five slides uh, with the sound. Um, we'll see if maybe we can go back and recreate that for the, the permanent version on the website. I'm sorry about that. I had no idea the, the sound wasn't working. Oh, that's um, fine. I, 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 I think it was the, the software. Um, the, the first five, I was just trying to categorize. I know you're supposed to give a talk with only three items, and I was giving a talk with ten items. Uh, uh, so I'm thinking how to sort them into different parts. It didn't even feel like ten. It felt great. <laughs> only nine, right? <laughs> yeah. it, 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 there's a three in there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, um, doesn't look like um, anyone's having any questions, which is fine. So, um, Thank you, Dr. Hotch, so much for your time and effort and expertise in putting this together. And I'll just say we'll wrap this up and look forward to seeing people at our pre-conference workshop and, of course, the general meeting at NAPCRAG in Montreal. Safe travels to everyone. Thank you again for the opportunity.